Welcome back. I'm Ms. Neuroth, and today we are talking about women and demographic change. What are you going to learn today? Changes in population have both long and short-term effects on a place's economy, culture, and politics, and women play a key role in these changes. The first subject we're going to talk about is women and education. So some really powerful things happen when women have an opportunity to obtain higher levels of education. First, they are better able to care for the children that they already have. They can become educated not only about reading and writing and things like that, but a key part of educating women is about how to better care for the children that they already have. When more babies survive, as you learned in the demographic transition model, Less babies are born when women feel confident that the children that they already have will survive. Secondly, they'll often have children later in life because they're working on continuing their education. There is a direct connection between the average years that women will be in school in a particular place and the number of babies they'll have. The more years in school, the less children typically women will have. Third, they will often want to utilize their education, so they may choose to have fewer children or wait longer to have children so that they may also work. Now let's talk about women and employment. When women are employed, they bring in more money to their household, which can help provide for their children's health and education. Employment can also allow women to play more roles in society and can help advance a country economically when they have more people, more working age adults, contributing to their GDP or contributing to the overall health of their economy. I have two examples here of types of jobs that women might take that would contribute to this um, idea of women helping in society. You have a teacher, that's me here, um, working a job in the tertiary sector. And this is just a little preview of something you'll be learning in the future in unit seven when you talk about economic development. So teaching or contributing in that way would be one way women may contribute in society. Of course, women can participate in many different sectors of the society. And the more women that participate in those sectors, the more money that's um, generated for their families and for their country. Uh, the picture on the right is actually of a woman that I met in Tanzania, and she and another group of women, or a whole group of women, had gotten together to create a, a bit of a co-op where they were um, roasting their own coffee. So they were actually growing the coffee beans and roasting them and drying them and then selling them. And this uh, allowed them, having this side job, allowed them to provide more food um, for their families. It allowed them to provide uniforms for their children so that they could go to school. So these opportunities, whether it's a job in the formal economy, like the picture of me teaching, or a job in the informal economy, um, either way, women having these opportunities can help provide for their families. Another aspect of changes in, in demographics, changes in population, is women and their access to health care. So women face unique health risks, uh, particularly because of childbearing. And these risks can affect the size and structure of the population, meaning when many women perish during childbirth, that can have a significant impact not only on the population of that moment, but of the population growth in the future, with less women means less children being born. So countries can assess the, the health of their women by really taking a look at that factor, the ma maternal mortality rate, or the annual number of female deaths per 100,000 live births from any cause related to pregnancy. This rate can give us a really good idea of the risk that women take in getting pregnant and the chances that they may have of perishing during a pregnancy. The lower that rate, the uh, better the healthcare system is in that particular place. The lowest rates of maternal mortality are attributed to better access to doctors and healthcare facilities. So much like you learned in the demographic transition model, more developed countries typically have lower maternal mortality rate, lower rates of death for women during childbirth. 
Finally, we take a look at this concept of women and contraception or birth control. When more women have reliable access to contraception, birth rates drop. Now, access to contraception can allow women to stay in school and in the workforce for longer periods of time. They don't have to worry about getting pregnant and then having the challenge of figuring out how to take care of maybe a large or growing family and also trying to work. So it allows uh, women to participate in these activities more easily. When women gain reliable access to contraception, it can cause shifts in social dynamics in societies. When more women are out in the workforce and participating in education, there are less women staying at home caring for large families. So some societies have to wrestle with this big shift in the dynamics as women take on very different roles in society. So what should you take away from all of this today? Changes in population have both long and short-term effects on a place's economy, culture, and politics, and women play a key role in these changes. In the next video, you will learn about how roles for females have influenced patterns of fertility, mortality, and migration. As I always say, keep your eyes out because geography is everywhere. Welcome back. I'm Ms. Neuroth, and today we're talking about women and demographic change. What are we going to learn today? Today we are learning about Ravenstein's laws of migration. E.G. Ravenstein developed a theory, often known as his laws of migration, that note distinct demographic patterns, including gender and family status, related to migration. Today, we are going to discuss how changing social, economic, and political roles for females have influenced fertility, mortality, and migration as illustrated by Ravenstein's laws of migration. Here's law number one in no particular order. His first law talks about gender patterns. So women are more likely to move internally within a country, whereas most international migrants are generally young males. Now, this trend used to hold true when males were the primary source of income for their families. However, we've noticed in recent years that as more females are taking on more roles in society and entering the workforce, we're seeing a huge rise in the number of female migrants as well, including international female migrants. An example to illustrate that Ravenstein's laws do still hold true in many parts of the world would be to take a look at the Gulf states in the Persian Gulf. You'll notice a huge influx of workers to these areas where uh, massive amounts of growth are happening in cities. Uh, you can see the construction going on in this picture here. And in some of these countries, there's an enormous influx of migrants to this area to do work on these large buildings, which is having a huge impact on the demographics of those countries. So a second law of uh, migration created by Ravenstein would be that most migrants are young adults and most of them are seeking employment. This makes sense because this cohort is more mobile and often less established, maybe less established in their job, more likely to be unmarried. And so they're able to move more easily and take advantage of opportunities that present themselves elsewhere. If we do see migrants that are older making a big international move, they're typically moving from more developed areas. A third law would be that typically people only move as far as they must. Therefore, most migrants only move short distances. You may remember our discussion before of the concept of distance decay, that things closer together will have more interaction than things that are far apart. So if a migrant is going to move to escape a natural disaster, for instance, they're probably not going to move across the entire country. They're more likely to move just as far as they need to to get out of harm's way. The next law would re relate to this concept of step migration. When mig migrants do decide to travel far distances, they typically take steps on their way from one place to another. So I think this 
example here illustrates this well. Let's imagine that there is a migrant moving from a rural China, an area in rural China. They would most likely move to a town first and then maybe a medium sized city before they would move to Beijing because that's a huge change to make in their lifestyle. So you typically wouldn't see someone moving from a rural area right into a very large city, but you would see some steps in between those two places. The next concept that Ravenstein discussed with this was this idea of counter migration, that each migration flow in one direction would produce a counter flow in another direction. So a way to think of this would be to imagine that there are some young workers in Spain that move to England for work, while a flow of older English people move to Spain to retire. Now, just because this is one of Ravenstein's laws doesn't necessarily mean that this is always the case in reality. This is something we talk a lot about in human geography, that these laws or these models or these concepts or theories give us a way to understand the world, but it is just one person's perspective, and there are always cases where those laws or theories don't hold true in reality. The next idea is this concept of rural to urban migration. Most migration historically, and currently the most prominent pattern globally, is from rural areas to urban areas. The most common reason for this kind of migration is economic. People are moving to cities in search of work. This is a great opportunity to pause and reflect on what we learned in unit one when we talked about scales of analysis. If we're looking at the globe as a whole, this trend holds true. But if we were to zoom into certain American cities, for instance, we are actually starting to see some counter urbanization or people moving out of cities and into the suburbs or even in rural areas. So on a more local scale, the trend may look different. But globally speaking, the broad pattern would be from rural to urban areas. In fact, fun fact, in the last few years, we have seen the first global shift to having more people living in cities than in rural areas. Never before in human history has this ever happened. So we're living in a pretty exciting time. All right, next, right along the lines of what I was just discussing, cities are places of opportunity and in particular economic opportunity in the form of jobs. So migrants that do move long distances will typically go to large urban areas because the perception is that these places have more opportunities, more services than smaller towns or cities would have. This leads us to my favorite law that Ravenstein developed and it is related to this concept of the gravity model, which is the hypothesis that more people will be attracted to large cities even if they're farther away. So the larger the urban area, the more pull it will have on migrants. Now you see this picture of outer space on the right-hand side. When I try to explain this to my students, there's often some confusion. So if you imagine outer space, we know that generally the larger a, uh, an object is in space, the more gravity it will have. So you can think about it in the same way. Larger planets or larger stars have a lot of gravitational pull on other objects. So larger cities like New York or London will have a lot of pull on people even from far distances away. So people are going to move short distances to places that are close by because those closer places can have gravity on the things that are close by. Whereas if I'm going to go a long distance, I'm much more likely to go to a large city because of the gravity model. Let's take a moment to practice this idea. Which of the following profiles characterizes the population group that is most likely to migrate? A, married, 25 years old. B, single, 25 years old. C, married and 50 years old. D, single and 50 years old. Or E, married and 65 years old. Well, as I discussed earlier, youth was one of Ravenstein's laws of migration, that people that are younger are typically more likely to be married, excuse me, more likely to move. Um, so that narrows it down a little bit. We often find that people that have less ties to their current situation are going to be more likely to move as well. So the answer here would be B, 
single and 25 years old. What should you take away from today? Well, Ravenstein noted that demographic patterns related to migration, including things like changing social, economical, and political roles for females, play a really important role in these patterns. In the next video, you're going to learn a little bit more about the trends in migration in the world today. As I always say, keep your eyes open because geography is everywhere.